looks the same Stepped out from the train As it need me My humble and my papa Down the lane Appalachia is a huge place. It's a contiguous region that covers 205,000 square miles in 13 states and is made up of 420 counties. It's bigger than California and every other state except for Alaska and Texas. Though the stereotype shows it as a rural and isolated place, it's diverse both in terms of its population's ethnicities and its geographic features. Major cities such as Pittsburgh and Cincinnati are well within Appalachia's borders, but so are incredible natural features such as the New River Gorge and Mount Katahdin. But Appalachia is something else and has been for over a century. Appalachia is America's biggest colony. To be specific, it is a resource colony, and its people, culture, civil society, and infrastructure have all suffered from this status and fact. The organization Earth Justice defines a resource colony as, quote, a plaything for industry and corporations to exploit, despoil, and leave to ruin, end quote. This is also known as having a resource curse. A region suffers under a resource curse when it has so many natural resources like oil, coal, or natural gas that they end up paradoxically actually having a worse record of economic development, fewer community resources, and less democracy when compared to other places with fewer natural resources. As fewer resources, leads to investment in not just one economic activity, but many, and into education, people, and innovation. This is certainly a descriptor of Appalachia and many of the communities and governments which are part of it. When we think about being a resource colony with a resource curse, all too often we think about the parts of the world that are less developed industrially being exploited by the world's industrial powers and international corporations. Yet, in the heart of the United States, the wealthiest nation in history, we find all the markings of corporate exploitation and occupation and all of the attendant consequences for Appalachia. Appalachia is a treasure trove of natural resources beginning with timber and accelerating through petroleum, natural gas, and on to the rich seams of coal, it has powered the industrial might and personal comfort of America for over 170 years. Beginning in the mid-1800s and growing exponentially after the end of the Civil War, Appalachian coal was in incredibly high demand. For nearly a century, the coal fields of West Virginia, Kentucky and Pennsylvania supplied the vast majority of America's coal. Much of it either heating homes, producing steel, and electricity. A situation that lasted until 1990. At the peak of its production, West Virginia, all by itself, produced half of the coal that came from Appalachia and employed more coal miners than any other state in the region. This level of production led to a situation where the entire economy of a vast swath of Appalachia and certainly entire states like West Virginia relied on the coal industry and the services provided to that industry, which meant that the people and corporations who owned that industry were supremely influential. This influence permanently warped the social, political, 
and cultural fabric of Appalachia. Corporations, and the people who tend to run them, are amoral. That is, completely indifferent to issues of fairness, compassion, humanity, or ethics. They are amoral because the capitalist culture of America demands that they put profit and material wealth above any other consideration, including human well-being, civil society, and the proper functioning of government. This means that the most influential element of Appalachian society only cared about their bottom line. They didn't care about the quality of Appalachia schools. They didn't care about the quality of local hospitals or clinics. They didn't care when the infrastructure, dams, mines, bridges, and roads they built largely for themselves failed and killed hundreds, if not thousands, of people. They cared about mine explosions and infrastructure failures only to the extent that production was delayed. Or, courts, ever so briefly, would hold them accountable. Because caring cost money, and corporations, especially resource extraction companies, are here only to make money. Farmington, West Virginia, November 20th, 1968. An explosion spread by coal dust and gas rips through nine working sections of the mine's west side. 78 miners die in the blast and 21 survivors make their way to the surface. Everybody around here got their water from abandoned coal mines. So it's just what you know around here. To not know it wasn't being treated for a while and drinking it, you know, it's, you don't really know what you come in contact with. <laughs> All my kids have grew up here and and we'd always been told it was clean. I was just making his bottles out of it like I would any other time until I was notified that it wasn't being treated. And it had done been about nine, 10 months. I mean, it makes you sick to your stomach because you don't know what harm you've done to your child. And you know, it might not show up now, but five years down the road, you know, it could affect him. <laughs> Two years ago is when we really started having major problems with the water. You know, everybody just up and quit. So we've, everything that's been done, the community has done ourselves. We have to pay out of pocket, you know, if some, a pipe bust or anything like that, we have to go get the part. And it's hard to just drop everything you're doing to go up there and fix something, but you have to, or you won't have water. And then if you keep letting the leak go and go and go, it'll eventually dry up what, you know, the reserve we have up there. You know, we've went through periods of not having any water at all you know, for weeks or months at a time, or just having a little bit of a drip. It was actually last year, uh, it was around no end of October, 1st of November, you could barely even wet your toothbrush with it. And actually the people that lived on the hill up here, they didn't have any at all. We've just been trying to keep the water flowing, you know, because we don't have the money to treat it. We don't know how to treat it. I won't drink it. Like we just would buy a bottle of water, you know. I knew something was wrong with the water because we kept running out. You'd wash clothes and, and they'd be come back, you know, the water be dirty as can be. You don't know what you're drinking, you don't. And nobody, nobody can tell you nothing around here. You talk to one person, they'll tell you 10 different things. We want somebody responsible for it or something, you know. I want clean water, I want it to come from somebody, you know, like a company or something. You know, it's like below poverty, it's like you get your own. And one morning I went over there and I just put my cup under the spigot and I pulled it back and it looked like muddy water. I was like, wow, man, I do not want this. I've never been into taking in contamination purposely. <laughs> it was a four-wheeler accident on Route 60 on the hard road. I woke up two weeks later in the hospital coming out of a coma. Right here is a piece of titanium plate. Right here is a piece of titanium plate. And right here is a piece of titanium plate. And there are 12 titanium screws for the three titanium plates. It was two weeks after my first surgery, I caught the infection on my brain. MRSA, M-R-S-A. I've always 
call it MRSA. I had MRSA and staph infection inside my head. And then after my second surgery, I told my surgeon about my living conditions, how it was here. He said, please just try to wear a shower cap or go somewhere else to where it is good clean water. And I said, well, I'm going to do my best. Uh, I'm limited as to what I can do. Because of the first infection, it done serious damage to my liver. So I'm doing all I can to avoid anything that the doctors have told me because I was one before to just go about it my own way. I just finally realized the importance of the type of water that's coming in. They're supposed to, you know, redig the ditches, put new water lines in. Uh, and hook us all up, you know, on meters, and we'll pay by the gallon and stuff like that. Basically, we won't have to do nothing no more, you know. They'll bill us, they'll fix it, they'll treat it, you know, everything. It'll be good, clean drinking water. They was actually supposed to have started in April or May, and here it is almost July, and they still haven't. Say cheese! We're not a third world country, you know. We live in America, and it's 2017, you know. It ain't like our great-grandparents had to go out and pump water, you know. It should be when we come in, we should be able to turn on the faucet and there's water. It's terrible. Due to its status as being the only state completely within the Appalachian region, let's take a look at West Virginia as an example of how the people fare when it comes to a land being owned by corporations which only care about their bottom line and who are not based there. According to a 2013 study, just 25 individual owners, mostly corporations, own 17.6% of the entire state, excluding public property. In fact, in six counties, primarily located in the southern coal fields of West Virginia, 50% of the county's private land is owned by just 10 landowners. When you look at land ownership throughout the entire state, all of the top 10 private landowners are headquartered out of state. To a large degree, West Virginia is not owned by West Virginians, much like the rest of Appalachia. It's occupied territory. At the time of that report, West Virginia's largest landowner was a relatively new type of corporation that did not exist earlier in the state's history. This is the Timber Management Company, whose sole mission is to hoard forest and other woodland as a financial asset, something that could be used to either finance other projects or used as a store of value in difficult times for the company. They fence and gate off huge amounts of forest within West Virginia and use it for nothing other than a financial resource. Typically, the citizens of the local community have no access or use of the land. For example, West Virginia's largest landowner is a North Carolina-based hardwood forest land company that owns over half a million acres across 31 of West Virginia's 55 counties. It owns more of West Virginia's private land than anyone or anything else. Land that no one uses for anything other than a private financial asset to benefit a company that is not headquartered in the state it largely owns. One of the most important indicators of being a resource colony is the amount of land and resources that are owned by people who do not live and are not based in that region. Appalachia is largely owned by other people. In a study conducted throughout Appalachia using representative samples, it was estimated that private companies own nearly half of the surface area of the entire region. Specifically, 43% of the land that constitutes Appalachia is owned by companies or corporate entities. When you also consider that various governments own about 8% of the land, you can see that less than half of the usable area of Appalachia is owned by the people who live there. This has been true since the beginning of Appalachia's identity. As early as 1810, 93% of the region that would become West Virginia, uh, 
the state synonymous with Appalachia and the only state to be completely within Appalachia was owned by people who did not live there. Other states or regions that have experienced a rise in absentee ownership of property have addressed that issue through political processes wherein special fees or taxes are levied on properties that are owned by people or companies whose primary residence is not in the region. Or, those fees are levied when the absentee owners fail to maintain the property, develop the property, or use it in a purposeful manner. However, this simply is not happening in most of Appalachia. It's not an isolated problem in a city that may be affecting a single central business district or a few neighborhoods. This problem is pervasive throughout the region, which means that corporations are in control through dent of ownership and through absolute control of the economy. Resource and land companies use their outsized political influence to make sure they never have to use the land for the benefit of local citizens, much less pay their fair share of taxes. Natural resource companies have incredibly outsized amounts of political power in places like West Virginia and throughout Appalachia. In the states with large Appalachian regions, no politician of any party is viable if they propose anything that smacks of an attack on the dominant resource industry. And by attack, what is generally meant is being required to pay one's fair share of taxes instead of playing Space Cowboy. I am Paula Jean Swearingen, candidate for United States Senate, and I approve this message. I was born in these hills. So was my grandfather who lost his life to black lung disease. Coal miners today are still risking their lives to feed their families. They fight over pay, their health care the ability to even retire at all. And it's not just them. It's teachers, nurses, small business owners, farmers, blue collar citizens, fighting for a right to live in this state that we call home. Those decades of abuse are showing their effects with every business that closes its doors. For every child that we raise to leave these hills, not because they want to, it's because they have to. Complaining about taxes may be one of the oldest rights of any citizen anywhere in any nation. For a long time, taxes were generally seen as the whim and for the private benefit of a small ruling elite. But that's not the modern use of taxes when we talk about progressive democracies. Taxes are the price we pay to live in a safe, secure, civilized society. While we invest part of our savings to help finance the world's most efficient business system, at the same time we pay taxes to government to finance many kinds of services which also contribute to our way of life. For example, our taxes must provide the necessary funds to improve and expand our school system. Our taxes must be sufficient to pay for city streets, health, fire, and police protection, and of course, aid to the needy. Our state taxes help pay for highways, educational institutions, and among other things, help to finance important experiments to increase the productivity of our farms. Our federal taxes pay for irrigation and reclamation projects, for national parks, postal services, the Weather Bureau and many other services. Our taxes have to pay for the enormous cost of past wars and provide the funds for a defense program which will ensure the safety of our country. In addition, all of us should be willing to pay whatever taxes are necessary to enable efficient government to improve or expand any essential service. Taxes are the price we pay so that we can give our children a better society in which to grow up. Taxes aren't the problem. It's only when they are unfair, inequitable, and thoughtlessly spent that a problem occurs. Yet the number one political goal 
of natural resource companies in any resource colony like Appalachia is to keep taxes on themselves so low that they can maximize their profits at the expense of our future and the basic needs of the communities they are exploiting. Because of their political control of the environment, based on large political donations and threats to leave should they be taxed the same as anyone else, they manage to scare politicians and the citizens they represent into submission, as if the role of an exploitable resource colony is the very best for which Appalachians can hope. How has that been working out for us? This influence is largely possible because of all the money you're able to hoard. A situation that becomes a vicious cycle where corporations can use the money they have stockpiled and their position of influence to keep their taxes absurdly low or even reduce them so they can then have more money and power to convince citizens and their representatives to lower those taxes again to the point where the society cannot properly function, which is exactly what these corporations want. An excellent example of this is the property tax. In most states, citizens who do not qualify for a rare exemption in the law pay property tax based on 100% of the value of what they own, typically their home or car. Resource corporations do not do this. From their point of view, property taxes are for suckers, and to them, common property owners like you and I are very much suckers. In many cases, companies that mine coal, manage forests, or extract natural gas have their property valued at only a fraction of its actual value. And then it's taxed even less on that already low valuation. This means two major things. One, our civil society simply doesn't have enough money coming in to maintain the basic needs. Schools, hospitals, roads, public safety. Two, the taxes that are collected are disproportionately on the shoulders and backs of individual citizens in the working and middle classes, the very people who can afford it the least. While these natural resource corporations haul lightly taxed truckloads of cash right out of Appalachia. Let's look specifically at Wyoming County, West Virginia, located in the heart of Coal Production Company. The top 10 landowners in that county hold 75.8% of the county's private land, and just two of those companies, the railroad Norfolk Southern that made its money transporting coal out of Appalachia, and the aforementioned Hartwood Forest Land Company of North Carolina together own 50%. Additionally, the land owned by these companies was grossly undervalued. For example, a subsidiary of Norfolk Southern, the Pocahontas Land Company, a notorious institution in southern West Virginia, owned more than 77,000 acres in Wyoming County, making it the owner of 25% of all private land in the county. According to the research conducted by Utah State University Forestry Extension Service in 1993, the value of a single tree as a bulwark against erosion and a provider of air conditioning, wildlife protection, and pollution reduction, and not including its timber value, was $273. When accounting for inflation, a tree is worth $505 in 2021. Using the Ohio State University Guide for Valuing Appalachian Timber, the minimum value of a tree is $150, though it could be as much as $1,600. Thus, the total minimal value of a mature tree in Appalachia is $655. The number of trees on an acre of undeveloped forest land varies from 300 to 800. Taking the minimal number of trees and multiplying that by the minimal value of a tree, an acre of Appalachian forest is worth no less than $196,800.
Yet, in our Appalachian case study, those acres are only valued at $350. This is a land covered in valuable timber held specifically by the company for the purpose of providing an investment asset. Yet, the state purposely undervalued it so the company would have to pay far less in taxes than the citizens of West Virginia, whose government ostensibly serves and represents. Why? The ownership of so much land dictates more than just tax revenue. Much like a king or queen from the age of absolute monarchy in Europe, owning that much of the public space and private land creates an overwhelming authority for the elite who own it. They can dictate where new businesses are allowed to develop or if they are at all. They can prevent new businesses or potential rival businesses from even being formed for lack of space or land to begin. They can threaten to withhold or reduce the meager taxes they already pay in order to get government to act exactly the way they wish, including lowering their already low taxes. They prevent reasonable environmental protection, and they even regulate how much recreation local citizens can enjoy. While having never visited more of Appalachia than a governor's office. Appalachia's absentee property owners have so much money they can dictate a narrative of society that supports their gross amount of private ownership, convincing people it's a heroic action to deprive the citizens of their land and services in the name of greater profits for millions and billionaires. When a political candidate runs on a platform of environmental protection, tax, and land reform, even in the name of doing what's right for the people, these coal and other natural resource companies can spend so much money as to not only drown out that candidate, but make her look any way they choose, so long as it is unacceptable to the social values of the voters. In Appalachia, this is true of both major parties. Money and ownership mean resource companies dictate the values of the people through economic control and the flooding of our airways and internet with their questionable views, needs, and negative propaganda against anyone who denies them their maximal profit. And so we see the money generated by Appalachian labor, sacrifice, blood, and bodies pours not into Appalachian communities, but outside Appalachia, where the public isn't afraid to tax corporations properly, to build hospitals, schools, and public services in New York, Rhode Island, and Illinois, but never in Appalachia. Most of Appalachia consistently ranks low in educational attainment, in personal health, and in quality of life. But that's not because we are somehow deficient people. It was through our hard work that the American industrial system was able to become the most powerful in the world. Rather, it's because people who don't live here, people who only see us as resources to exploit and throw away, only care about one thing. How much money can we Appalachians make for them? Because that's what happens to a colony. Colonies are meant to be exploited for the exclusive gain, not of the people who live in the colony, but for the people who own the colony. That's the real reason the American Revolution happened. The reason the Irish Revolution happened. It's the reason the Indian Revolution happened. Because they were colonies being exploited by their owners for the benefit of only their oppressors and they refuse to allow it to happen anymore. There's a powerful line in a song from the musical Hamilton, quote, when are these colonies going to rise up, end quote. We don't need folks with muskets and support from the French to free ourselves from our corporate overlords and their coin-operated elected officials. It's us. We only need ourselves. It's not the politician's responsibility to do it for us. Yes, 
If they promise to represent us and our interest, we certainly should expect them to do so. But too many come right out and tell us that they won't put Appalachians first. Instead, they talk about the importance of coal. They talk about the importance of natural gas. And they talk about the importance of keeping taxes low on these already wealthy corporations who do not make Appalachia their home. And they never do what they should do for us. If resource corporations simply paid their taxes at the same rate, no more, just the same rate that we citizens of Appalachia already do, we would be able to have the type of society that the rest of the country and the best funded parts of the world already have. But that's not going to happen until we the people demand that it happen by electing officials who understand that, are willing to act on it, and we'll see we the people are willing to vote for them and determined to hold them accountable.